10, verse 24 through 25. Well, this is a financial show. We talk about investments, economics, retirement planning, but we also from time to time talk about the political issues that affect us. So with us today, I'm really excited. We've got a special guest with us. We've got Senator Barry Loudermilk. He is currently a candidate uh, for U.S. Congress in Georgia's 11th Congressional District. Uh, Barry has served in the Georgia State House from 2004 uh, to 2010. And in 2010, he was elected to the Georgia State Senate. On top of uh, serving in public office, Barry is also the owner and president of Innovative Network Systems, an information technology business. He's also the co-owner of Freedom Flight Center, a flight services company. But on top of being a small business owner and a public servant, he's also a private pilot and a veteran of the U.S. Air Force. Well, Mr. Laudermich, we'll appreciate you being with us today. David, it's a pleasure to be with you. I've been looking forward to this. Oh, well, great. Well, we appreciate you coming on. We're just going to dive right into it. So uh, Paul Ryan, and I know you follow this closely, but Paul Ryan recently came out with his budget, and he took some slack on it. But as I dive through it, what I noticed was there's really about $5 trillion in savings over the next 10 years. And I guess I want to talk about the budget and how it relates to the national debt. So it seems like the president really doesn't mind us putting more and more future generations in debt. But I just want to ask you specifically, one, on the Ryan budget, do you like it? And two, when it comes to our national debt, does having a a large national debt affect the U.S. economy? Well, as far as the Ryan budget goes, it's, you know, with with any any piece of legislation, there's usually good and bad in, in both sides of it. And there is some definitely some good stuff inside the uh, Ryan budget. First of all, it's an attempt to balance the budget, which we have to balance this budget. Sure. You know, as a business owner, I cannot spend more than I bring in on a continual basis and stay in business. In business, you know, when when families are uh, in uh, financial uh, crisis, they have to cut their spending, and when uh, the families uh, run up their credit card debt, the first thing we do is we take credit cards from them, and so. Uh, it does make an attempt at, at bringing into a balanced budget, and, and that's a good part. Another thing that it does is it moves some of the spending from the mandatory budget into the discretionary budget, which gives Congress more flexibility and, and more control over those uh, those uh, spending items. And it, it does make some cuts. It, it, it proposes some changes in the way that the uh, transportation funding is done, which gives the state more autonomy and more authority. The, the issue I have with it is I don't think it's aggressive enough. There's mm-hmm. still a lot of spending. There's 2,228 uh, different federal government assistance programs, entitlements. Uh, <laughs> so, that do you say, I'm sorry, do you say aggressive. 228 sorry. different entitlement programs? 2,228. Wow. wow. Different government assistance programs, just on the federal level. And so we need to be more aggressive in, in reducing the spending in government, and you brought up the debt. The debt is unbelievable. Uh, $18 trillion at the end of this fiscal year. And, and wow. you know, I, I didn't understand how much $18 trillion really is. Yeah. And when you talk to most uh, voters out there, they don't comprehend it. So I did a little research just to get an idea, to put it in perspective, how much $18 trillion is. And if you were to go back to the birth of Christ, the, the moment that Jesus was born and put $16,000 away, and every 60 seconds, every minute since the birth of Christ, you put away $16,000, you still wouldn't have $18 trillion today. That is unbelievable. It that is, is unbelievable. unbelievable. Just, the, just the interest payment alone on the debt uh, would have bought 2,700 F-35 fighter planes for our military, and they cost $151 million a piece. Now, that's just interest money we're throwing away. So it, it is a national security issue as well as an effect upon our, our economy. And it was so interesting that the scripture you started off with, um, it, it, it basically what that is describe, describing is, you know, the, the wise man who built his house upon the rock, there's stability. And, it, and the Bible also tells us that the foolish man builds his house upon the sand. Up, up on the sand. That's instability. Hmm. And what I see in our economy is we have a, a, a period of chaos. There's instability, even in my small business. Uh, we There's instability out there. I have projects that, are, uh, that we have uh, maybe six months out, but I don't know what we're doing 12. 
uh, 24 months out, where in the past I, I could project that, and that's what we're hearing from businesses. The debt is, is part of that because no one feels that Congress is serious about getting us out of this financial crisis. Obamacare has brought in instability. And so uh, what we have to do is get very, very serious in a short amount of time to start eliminating the debt to bring stability back into the economy. Oh, I think that makes sense. I mean, stability is key. It, it drives economic markets. So I, I couldn't agree more with you there. You brought up Obamacare. Now, obviously, that's an issue that's been in the news quite heavily uh, as of late. Kathleen Sebelius, we just found out this week, is actually stepping down from her post. And I know we all saw the disastrous rollout uh, of the marketplace, of the Obamacare marketplace that we saw over the last couple of years. But the administration is touting about 7.5 million signups on the new health care exchanges. So the question I have, when we look at Obamacare, if you're elected to Congress, is that something that you're, you're going to try to tackle? Or is that, do you see, or what are the, the issues in Obamacare that you would change if you were elected today? Well, in my opinion, and I think the opinion of, uh, of most that, that pay attention is Obamacare cannot work. I mean, the numbers just do not match. <laughs> There's no way we can make this thing work. It is going to have to go away. And, and uh, But the reality of it is uh, we're likely not to get this thing repealed uh, at least until 2017, even if the Republicans take the Senate and the House and the Senate both pass a, a complete repeal. Uh, the president's already said he's got a phone yeah. in the and he's going to veto this thing. Yeah, I don't see so him uh, overturning that anytime soon. You're exactly, yeah, you're right. Yeah, I mean, we're not going to have the votes to override a veto. Um, I think whoever the next president is, even if it's a Democrat, they're going to have to start peeling back on this because of, of the, the disaster it is. I meet with businesses uh, continually during this campaign, and there are many of them that are laying off simply because of Obamacare. I met with a gentleman the other day who is trying to get a job. He's a civil engineer, and he is uh, he has years of experience, and he's having a hard time getting a job. The work is there, but what they're telling him is, because of Obamacare, the premiums on you because of your age are so high. We would love to buy. We would love to hire you, but we can't afford your premiums, so they're hiring younger workers who are less experienced. So it is, it is killing our economy. What we need to do is be proactive, have a plan in place that is market-based, that empowers the patient and the doctor relationship. But we also need to take advantage of a couple of issues that uh, what I call loopholes in the Obamacare plan. And one of those is in Section 10,104, and it exempts direct primary care from Obamacare. And direct primary care is the simplest of all health care plans. It's just like when you take your car to the repair shop. When you go pick it up, you pay cash for the service. That's what direct primary care is. And there are doctor's offices, even in the Atlanta area now, that are moving to a direct primary care model to where if you need to go and, uh, for instance, there is an outpatient surgery center in Woodstock, uh, they, the ear, nose, and throat center, that when you go in, they will hand you a price list, $2,600 for a tonsillectomy, everything included. You pay cash for it. If you don't have the cash, they'll finance it for you. If they were to go through the insurance program, they bill about 5800 and what they actually take in is much less than if they just do the cash model. So if we can uh, if, if we can pass legislation that firms up the health savings account and allow uh, remove the caps from health savings accounts and allow HSAs to pay for direct primary care uh, services, uh, now we're really getting into free market reforms, and that ability is already there under Obamacare to do that. So I think we need to start focusing on things like that. You know, that's a great point, because a lot of folks don't realize that, you know, we've got this third-party intermediary that's going between us and our health care, right? And if, if, we, if consumers have the power of choice to pick and choose the medical service that they need, yeah, no question, in my opinion, that brings costs down. So I think uh, that's a great point. You know, we've got a couple of minutes left, and I've got one or two more questions for you, but I just want to ask you just kind of a, a straight-up question. I know you've got kids, and you do a lot. I've seen your children involved with some of the stuff that you're doing, but it's a simple question, but I think it's an important one. Do, do you think that we're leaving a better America for future generations in this country? Do you think we're, gonna, we're leaving the same America that our parents and future generations left us? Are we doing that for the next generation? We're not at this point, and in fact— uh, 
not long after I announced I was running for Congress, which I had no intention of doing at this point in my life, but uh, uh, I was speaking at a high school baccalaureate service, and uh, the pastor that was introducing me came up to me as he was literally walking up to the pulpit to introduce me, and he said, I know you're not here campaigning, but I think it's important that these people know that you're running for Congress. And he said, in one sentence, can you tell me why you're running for Congress? And I pointed to where my three grown children were sitting, and I said, because they deserve better than what we're passing on to them. As I, as I talked to my children about what life was when I was young, growing up, they look at me and they said, Dad, that's what we want. We just want the America that you had. When you look at the overregulation that we have today, uh, the, the, the next generation does not believe in the American dream. They don't believe they can achieve it. They want it. But I was speaking to some college students recently, and I said, how many of you believe that you have the freedom and the ability in this country to achieve the American dream? And hardly any of them raised their hand. They've lost hope in this nation. I believe we can take it back. But we have to first instill within their mind, what is that American dream? Well, it's it's however you define it, whatever you want to achieve in life. But we have created such an environment in this nation that if we've transitioned from a government of the people to a government over the people. Hmm. And we need to have go from this big government era back to where our founding fathers envisioned, which was a federal government that had such little impact on your life, you tend to forget it existed. You know, and I think we can give them a better future. We probably won't see it in our lifetime, but we can start things going in that direction to give them a future that is free, safe, and full of opportunity. You know, that's, uh, those are some encouraging words, Senator Loudermilk. And, you know, we just got about 60 seconds left. Where can voters go uh, to to a website, if you can give us that, and also the the important date coming up that you want, uh, voters need to come out and vote uh, if they like what they heard today for for you? Absolutely. You can go to our website, standwithbarry.com. That's standwithbarry.com. Dot com. The election is uh, just less than 40 days away. It's on May 20th. It's the earliest it's ever been in the state of Georgia. But uh, May the 20th is a Republican primary. Uh, there's no Democrat running for this seat. So by May 20th, we'll determine who the next congressman for District 11 will be. Um, we, are, we are very excited, motivated. We believe that May 20th will be the beginning of turning this nation around. Most every major conservative organization in America, the most respected conservative political organizations agree, and we have been endorsed by more of those than any other candidate in the nation. Yeah. So there is a movement to take America back, and we would love people to join our team. Just go to standwithbarry.com. And you guys have been raising, I mean, obviously you've seen success in raising money, but we still need it. So if you want to help to donate, go to standwithbarry.com. Uh, Mr. Lauder, we appreciate you being with us so much. Thank you for your time, and best of luck to you here uh, on the election. All right, David. Thank you very much. Thanks. All right, folks. Well, don't go anywhere. We've got one more. We've got a couple more segments coming up after the break. We're going to talk about the markets. We've had a crazy week in the markets. Don't go anywhere. You're listening to Protecting Retirement right here on 640 AM WGST. We'll see you after the break.